a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you another in their exciting new series of broadcasts on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Each week, Hallmark will bring you true-to-life stories of actual persons who, in their own way, have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Presented on the Hallmark Hall of Fame by our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame, respectfully dedicated to those men and those women whose service, sacrifice, and devotion have made our lives better, but about whom we know too little. Now, you've seen those gay stickers on the windows of cars that read Yellowstone National Park, picture of old faithful geyser, Zion National Park, Crater Lake, Oh, and a score of others. But who, who pasted those stickers on those windows? Why, you say, uh, happy vacationers, refreshed and ready for their daily tasks again. Well, somebody else put them there. A man named Nathaniel Pitt Langford, because his heart was firm and his faith was steady. We have the most inspiring vacation lands on earth. Free! His dynamic, true story follows in, in a moment. And now, here's Frank Goss from the makers of all my cards. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying hallmark on the back when you select it. For words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste, let the hallmark on the back be your guide. For that hallmark tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture Lily, starring Leslie Caron, Mel Ferrer, and Jean-Pierre Amont. And now, here is Lionel Barrymore with the first act of your Hallmark Hall of Fame. America, the early 1800s. A running man. He runs like the wind, his clothes hang in tatters, his head's bruised and bleeding, his eyes stare, at his heels, tomahawk raised, runs an Indian. Suddenly the man whirls, puts an arm lock on the Indian. He has the tomahawk now. Ah, you devils! Catch me! Catch John Coulter and die! Come on! Come on! I tell you, I did see these things. Boiling lakes of mud. Spires of steam roaring 150 feet into the air. A cliff of black glass. <laughs> Don't laugh. Don't laugh. <laughs> I didn't run the gauntlet of Blackfoot Indians to be laughed at. <laughs> Mr. Coulter, you admit you suffered severe and unsettling hardships in this improbable land you say you discovered? It's not improbable. It's there. I saw it. <laughs> Listen to me. A golden canyon and a jade river. A waterfall twice the height of Niagara. <laughs> I saw it, I tell you, it's there in Wyoming. This smoking land of yours, let us call it Coulter's Inferno. Laugh! <laughs> 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 Laugh, La La you fools! Someday you'll see! <laughs> Two 
generations past. The year is now 1870. A long time since John Coulter spoke of this smoking land of strange and terrible grandeur. Two horsemen of the Washburn, Langford, Doan expedition scout in twilight. Their Judge Cornelius Edges and Nathaniel Langford. Strange, wild country, Langford. Inspiring country, Judge. We can stop and water the horses here. Turn back, I think. What enormous solitude. I can see how John Coulter might have lost his mind here 60 years ago. I see nothing to confirm his story of a satanic world of steam and sulfur and bizarre beauty. Do you, Langford? I wish I did. Renew, renew my faith in miracles and in human reliability. I really think we'd best turn back, Langford. What the devil? I shot Indians. Cheyenne, we can't go back. Right ahead, then. Get up there. Right ahead. distance those Cheyenne almost seemed as if they didn't want to catch us. Well, you get some sleep, Langford. I'll stand first watch. Deep night. Then a monstrous moon rising behind the jagged ranges. Utter loneliness. A moon world, pallid and mysterious. The ghosts of ancient immemorial tribes seem to haunt the solitude. It's a night for mighty revelations, for miracles and ghosts. It's 1870. It's moonlight. It's wilderness. It is... Nathaniel Langford being shaken out of a deep sleep by his friend, Judge Hedges. Langford, wake up. Uh, wake up. Uh, listen. Coyote. Good night. No, no, the other sound. Uh, yes. I, I can feel the earth tremble. Earthquake? I don't know. Hedges, look. Great Scott. Boiling water. Tons of it, Hedges. Boiling water and steam shooting 150 feet into the air. Hedges, John Coulter wasn't mad. Oh, we are. This is the country of the Yellowstone. night for revelations and for ghosts and miracles. A dawn for new miracles of thunder and steam and breathless grandeur. Night again for council around the campfire of the Yellowstone expedition. Yes, gentlemen. John Coulter's inferno of two generations ago is a fact. Immense jets of boiling water and steam shooting into the air, gentlemen. Lakes of boiling mud colored like the devil's own paint pot. And the canyon. Magnificent. And, and the Great Falls, twice as high as Niagara. Just as John Coulter said. Well, we we never it's believe, very uh, interesting, uh, Langford. Amazing. What, in your opinion, is the prospect of finding, say, uh, gold there? Gold? Or in what other way can this howling, sputtering circus you described be turned into hard cash? Judge Hedges will tell you briefly what we discussed on our way back to camp. Judge? Well, I'm a legal man. I formulated a principle which Langford and I wish to apply to the Yellowstone. There should be no private ownership of any part of the region, none. 
That's so. Yes, this land must belong to the people. It, it, it must be set aside as a national park for all the people. Are you crazy, Langford? I don't think so, Mr. Jarrett. Give away the land to a rabble? I don't know what to make of property. Maybe there's gold in there. Maybe there isn't, Jarrett. All right, maybe there isn't. But there are more ways than one to make a fortune unknown to Nat Langford's picnickers. Picnickers? Picnickers, Langford. You're planning to turn this country into a free picnic ground for America's great unwashed. Have you a better plan, Mr. Jarrett? Yes, I have a better plan. Men, stake out your claims in the Yellowstone. It's a fine, spectacular property. Fine for sightseers and tourists. Maybe the hot springs Langford talks about will make mineral baths for the unwashed at so much per head. But a public picnic ground. Not if I can help it. You go your way and I'll go mine. A powerful and determined man, that Jarrett. I know. But the thunders of the Yellowstone were to me the sound of Anthems in the darkling wood. Very apt. But Jared would say rot. Yeah, speak of the devil. See you at the picnic, boys. He's heading toward the Yellowstone. Alone? Why? To stake a claim, perhaps. Who knows? Let him. I take my oath here in the wilderness, which is the greatest of temples. This land shall belong to all the people. A national park, a cathedral, call it anything. It will be the people's. It must. moment, we will return to the second act of our true story of Nathaniel Pitt Langford. For many of us, Easter time, like Christmas, brings nostalgic memories. Grandmother may think of riding to church in a horse-drawn surrey. Mother may recall how tall the lilies looked in the old family church. And uh, Dad may remember the way the parson shook his hand as if he were a grown man instead of a little boy in his best Sunday suit. Yes, Easter is a time for reminiscing and a time to give thanks that we live in a free land where each of us can worship in his own way. On this Easter Sunday, perhaps you would like to share your feelings with friends you can't see, with the family you knew in your childhood. If you would, I think you'll find Hallmark Easter cards are a perfect way to express those feelings. You can choose Hallmark Easter cards that have a deep religious appeal that are reminders of the promise and glory of the first Easter Sunday long ago. These are the cards you'll be especially proud to send, for they say, in a most gracious way, Happy Easter to you. And now here is Lionel Barrymore. Morning after the campfire disagreement, the whole expedition entered the strange, unearthly land of the Yellowstone into enchantment and awe. Then they turned back to Helder, Montana. There, Nathaniel Langford began to prepare his program for converting the Yellowstone to a great national park. Yes, come in. You always leave your door unlocked, Langford? Oh, good evening, Judge. Come in, come in. Any reason why I shouldn't leave my door unlocked? Good question with a very practical answer. Now sit down here. What are you writing there, if I may ask? Oh, my plan for a national park. Bringing us face to face with the answer to why you should lock your door. Jarrett is in town. Oh? Uh -huh. He's already organized a company for building a resort hotel in the Yellowstone. He hasn't. Staked several large clans, yeah. I won't let him go through with it. He says rather noisily that he won't let you turn the place into a picnic ground. <laughs> yes, he would twist my word and my purpose that way. He's prepared to twist your arm until you cry for mercy. How's that? He says he's prepared to deal with you. Deal with you. Whatever that means. Wyoming and Montana are still pretty untamed, and justice, I'm sorry to say, is slower than gunpowder. You really ought to leave town, Nat. Oh, I am leaving town in the morning. I'm headed for Washington. Uh-uh. Huh? Why not? Not tomorrow morning. Tonight. 
I'm ready to face Jarrett. If you do, you may never get to Washington, son. Oh. You pack light. I'll ready your horse. Where you are. Jarrett. Get off that horse. Jarrett, I'm not armed. Get down all the more smartly then. What if I don't? You'll fall down. Dead. You're bluffing. Got a lunatic. Next time I won't miss. I'm going to ride straight at you, Jarrett. I'm going to ride straight at you, headed for Washington. You can be ridden down or you can step out of the way. You're bluffing. Yeah. I'll shoot. All right, go ahead, shoot! By horseback, stagecoach, and train, Nathaniel Langford works his way east, bringing to crossroads and villages and cities his dream of the Yellowstone as a sanctuary for all living things as a place of peace and beauty and inspiration for all Americans. Aptly, aptly has William Cullen Bryant called the groves God's first temples. And I tell you that one cannot stand in the land of the yellow stone and not hear, as I did, the sound of anthems in the geysers of the yellow stone. Like I said, folks, plumb crazy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, citizens of New York City, I have been called a lunatic on this lecture tour. I can understand why. I myself questioned the testimony of John Calder until I myself saw the wonder and the splendor of the Yellowstone. You've never been called a lunatic by somebody who was there with you, Langford. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I was on that expedition into the Yellowstone. Believe me, believe me, I saw no such marvels as this fevered orator describes. Ladies and gentlemen, at this moment, there is pending in Congress a bill to establish the Yellowstone as a national park. That man was on our expedition, but he wants to profit personally from the land. My friend, do you want to pay taxes to maintain a picnic ground in a wild that only explorers dare penetrate? I oh, no, 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 no. this colorful speaker... If he was or was not fired upon by Cheyenne Indians near his proposed picnic ground. There are hostile Indians now, yes. Does that mean there will always be hostile Indians? The question, sir, were you or were you not shot at by Indians? I was shot at by Indians, yes. My but good they... people, you have a choice between paying taxes on a super picnic ground patrolled by hostile savages or writing your congressman to vote against the National Park Bill. Well, he's right. He's right. Listen to me. The man is right. Listen to me. Battle is almost over, and Nathaniel Langford is tired. In a last effort to win the public, he persuades a magazine publisher to accept an article about the Yellowstone country. It's the last gun of the battle. Sadly, by train, by stagecoach, by horse, Nathaniel Langford returns to Helena, Montana. On a weird moonlit night, he again enters the eerie land of the Yellowstone alone. How still. And how wasted. How infinitely lonely and unearthly in the moonlight. The velvet silhouette of the mantled hills and ghosts. The groves were God's first temples. And the everlasting wind of the great canyon. The sound of anthems in the darkling wood. And the solemn, monstrous feathers of the geysers soaring like phantoms into the phantom night. Beautiful. And wasted. Wasted. Deeply moved, Nathaniel P. 
Pitt Langford returns to civilization. He sends a long message to the publisher in New York. I have lost my plea to our people for a national park. It was my deep belief that so magnificent and solitary a grandeur, so soul-filling a spectacle as the Yellowstone created through the ages and rehearsed faithfully without human audience for an eternity, was not for profit and not by chance, but in good time for the race of man and all his children. Was I wrong? Yes. Oh, Judge Hedges, how are you, sir? There was a telegram for you at the station. Oh, I'll go get it. I told him I was stopping by this way. Here's the wire. Oh, thank you, Judge. Yeah. It's from the President of the United States. Read it. Like some thousands of our countrymen, I chance to read your final confession of defeat. In response to the thousands of letters received by the Congress, I have this day put my signature to the bill making the land of the Burning Mountain and of the Yellowstone a national park. Langford. It, it would be only just were you to honor us by becoming first superintendent of Yellowstone National Park. Go on, go on. I, I can't. Well, may I? Permit me, sir, to congratulate you upon your unremitting courage and on the generosity of your instinct, which has made my own way clear in this happy matter. Generations of Americans will soon witness the performance of that sublime spectacle rehearsed, as you say, for an eternity. I join my gratitude to theirs. Ulysses S. Grant, President of the United States. Well, he'll want an answer to his offer, the superintendency. I'll, I'll tell him... I have heard the sound of anthems in the darkling wood. Amidst the cool and silence... I kneel down and offer to the mightiest solemn thanks. Daniel Pitt Langford made the fabled land of the Yellowstone a reality for all of us. And with it began the greatest national park system on earth. He served five years without pay as first superintendent of the park, administering an immense wonderland as large as Delaware and Rhode Island combined. Today, Yellowstone National Park is host to over a million visitors a year. Truly, Nathaniel Langford heard anthems in the darkling wood for all of us to share. <laughs> well, we've got another wonderfully interesting person to honor on next week's Hallmark Hall of Fame. But first, Frank Garcy, he's here to tell us about a grand old friend with great big ears that'll soon be paying us a visit. Well, if you have little folks at your house, you're probably answering a lot of questions these days. Questions like, uh, when's the Easter Bunny coming? What will he bring? How does he know where we live? Well, it's fun to perpetuate the legend of Mr. Easter Rabbit. And yet, most of us want to teach our youngsters much more about Easter Tide. We want them to understand the true loving spirit of the season and to learn the selfless habit of giving. Now, one of the nicest ways you can help your boys and girls to be thoughtful of others this season is by taking them shopping for Hallmark Easter cards. You'll find appropriate cards for each of the children's relatives and friends at fine stores across the country. Cards for aunts and uncles, for grandparents and teachers, and for playmates or chums at school. And there are dozens of Hallmark Easter cards for you to send to the children, too. Yes, and there's something else to remember. Your lesson in giving will be complete if you see to it that an Easter seal goes on every card you mail. Don't forget to buy Easter seals for crippled children one day soon. 
And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. There was a Frenchman, Joubert by name, who once said, children have more need of models than of critics. <laughs> and it's so true. We can do a great deal to teach our youngsters thoughtfulness, friendliness, and unselfishness. And the little rascals catch on mighty quick, too. You know, just the other afternoon, a cute little trick with big brown eyes and lots of freckles who lives near me, little Anne, her name is, she's four. Well, Anne brought me over some cookies her mom had baked, and she was just beaming with pride at her own gift. Yes, but we can't start too young to think of others and to do things for others and to learn how to be a friend. Those are the only sure ways I know of being really happy. <laughs> well, there I go philosophizing again when I'm supposed to be telling you about next week on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. We're going to bring you the thrilling story of the man who joined two great continents in spite of seemingly insurmountable obstacles. The story of Cyrus W. Field and the laying of the first Atlantic cable. Our Hallmark Hall of Fame is every Sunday. Our producer-director is William Gay. Our music was arranged by Earl Towner. And our script tonight was written by Milton Geiger. Until next Sunday, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. <laughs> For Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. The part of Nathaniel Pitt Langford was played by Lamont Johnson with Ted DeCorsi as Judge Hedges, Gerald Moore as Jarrett, Tom Tully and Polly Bear as Coulter and his companion. Ladies and gentlemen, spring will soon be here and that means more of us will be out on the roads driving with our families. More traffic unfortunately means more accidents. And the National Safety Council urges all of us to drive extra carefully, obey all traffic signals, make sure all parts of our cars are in top working order. Don't turn that Sunday afternoon jaunt into tragedy. Drive carefully. Every Sunday, Hallmark Cards presents two great programs for the whole family's enjoyment. The Hallmark Hall of Fame on radio with host Lionel Barrymore and on television with Miss Sarah Churchill. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true-to-life story of actual persons who in their own way have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Next Sunday, we honor Cyrus W. Field on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the PBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.